Please don't skip ahead yet. Hi, this is your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian, Josh LaRue. Just need a moment of your time. A lot of people don't know, but we're not able to monetize the channel here on YouTube due to the fact that the copyright holders of the books I narrate, the movies we rip, they get the ad revenue, and also being a partner on YouTube involves a lot of rules and censorship, and to do so would make it where a lot of the content, the audiobooks, the riffs, would have to be heavily censored or deleted completely. So we depend on amazing slashaholics like you to help fund the channel and keep it going and growing for years to come. And there's several fun ways to do that. You could join our Patreon right up there. And as a patron, you can join for as low as like $2, $5, $10 a month, on up as high as you want, and enjoy a lot of cool gifts like free ebooks, early access, exclusive content, even voicing characters and audiobooks here on the channel. You could also go to our PayPal and use the QR code right there. And uh, you can donate directly to the channel. We see all donations and we appreciate all of them. If you don't want to use the QR code or don't know how, you can use our PayPal email address, which will be in the description below and the pinned comment, as well as our Cash App uh, donation username. And a fun way to help the channel is through our Cameo right down there. Uh, on Cameo, you can ask for a birthday video, anniversary video. You can ask us to sing a song or something or ask us questions. And you can get a video from me, Alex, Sean, Master Evil, Mother Evil, the Rodeo Clown, any character from any show on the channel, or any character that I've voiced in the audiobooks. It's a fun way to help the channel. It's only $10 a video, and we'll have a lot of fun doing that. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoy tonight's content. Be excellent to each other. Please consider helping the channel. And always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Thank you. Child's Play The Novelization by Jeremy Terry Chapter 9 Andy at the Police Station Karen's heels pounded at a staccato beat on the tiled floor of the police precinct, the clicking sound echoing from the high vaulted ceiling of the lobby. She passed by a wall of black and white photos of uniformed men and women who were forever immortalized there for having given the ultimate sacrifice to the city. The polished brass plaque on the wall over the pictures named it the Wall of Remembrance. She passed by the solemn gathering and caught the attention of a young woman dressed in a plain brown skirt and white blouse. Pardon me, Karen said. I'm looking for Detective Lieutenant Norris. The woman opened her mouth to answer, but stopped when a familiar voice called out from down the hall. The two women turned to see the man himself trotting up, his signature half-grin on his face. He held out his hand to her, and she shook it. Thank you for coming down here, Miss Barkley. He said, placing a gentle hand on her shoulder and leading her down the hall past detectives and patrolmen busy about their own work. What's wrong? she asked. I came as soon as I got your message. Have you been home yet? Karen shook her head. No, I came straight here from work. Why? Mike stopped walking and faced her. He chewed on his lip for a moment as if unsure exactly how to go on, and then said, We have your son here. This was the last thing she had expected to hear. Why is Andy here? He's supposed to be at school. Mike motioned to a door to their right. Let's step into my office. She followed him inside and sat in a plaid pattern armchair that sat in front of his desk. The room smelled of aftershave and leather. Good smells. She took the opportunity to look around as he moved to sit not behind his desk but in another armchair beside her. The office was neater than she would have expected. The stacks of papers on his desk, each organized and straight. There was a framed commendation for valor in the line of duty on the wall over his desk chair and a small trophy featuring a tiny bronze man aiming a pistol that sat on top of his filing cabinet. He cleared his throat to get her attention, and she turned back and met his troubled eyes. I don't know how to tell you this, Mrs. Barkley. Tell me what? He looked away, unable to hold her gaze. Something bad, then. She reached out and put a hand on his to draw him back. Please tell me what's wrong. His shoulders slumped, and he sighed. I've had to arrest Andy. 
Shock and fear washed over her, and she pulled her hand back, wrapping her arms tightly around her chest, as if to keep it from bursting wide with the power of her emotions. Mike leaned forward in his seat, his hand raised to comfort, but stopped halfway to her and let it fall back into his lap. He looked helpless. Can I get you water or something? He asked. Karen took three deep breaths to calm herself and felt the spinning world around her begin to slow. She shook her head. What did you arrest him for? Murder. Mike said. What in the world? Exactly who did he kill? Your friend Maggie Peterson, for one. Karen stood up, waving her hands in front of her face. No way! That's crazy! Andy loved her! She was like an aunt to him! I know that, but... He reached over and pulled a tan folder from the top of the nearest stack of papers and showed it to her. This is the coroner's report on Mrs. Peterson. The autopsy showed that she was hit very hard on the forehead with a hard instrument before she went out the window. That doesn't prove a damn thing, she sputtered. Maybe she stumbled and hit her head before she fell. Mrs. Barkley, do you remember the footprints on the kitchen counter? If your son stood on the counter where those prints were, he would have been at the exact height to hit Mrs. Peterson in the forehead. Karen began to pace the small office, biting her nails. I'm telling you that's impossible. I know my son. Andy would never do a thing like that. There's something else. Mike said, interrupting her. Eddie Caputo died this afternoon. Karen stopped pacing and stared at him. Who? Haven't you heard about him on the news? Mike asked. Karen shook her head, so he continued. Eddie Caputo was the Lake Shore Strangler's partner. They'd drive around town, pick up women, then take them back to one of the hideouts where they would torture and kill them together. All right, Karen said. So a psychopath died this afternoon. What's that got to do with Andy? Caputo escaped from jail. Someone blew up his hideout today with him inside. Your son was found sitting outside clutching the doll when we arrived. A wave of nausea came over Karen, and she had to fight to keep her lunch down. I don't understand any of this. I dropped Andy off at school this morning. How did he get outside some psycho's murder house? Where is he? I want to see him. Mike stood. Don't worry, he's fine. We have him in the next room being questioned. She turned for the office door. Let me see him. Mike grabbed her hand to hold her for a moment, staring into her wide eyes. Are you sure you're in the shape for this right now? Maybe you should take a few minutes to calm down first. She put the hand, not holding the doorknob, on top of his and gently pulled it off her. I'm perfectly calm. Please, let me see my son. Mike watched her for a few seconds more and then nodded. Karen opened the door and he pointed to another across the hall from them. They crossed to it and stepped inside a small dim room where several people stood staring through a window that looked on to another room. Karen moved to the window and saw Andy and his doll sitting on a couch beside the mustachioed detective whom she'd spoken to upon arriving to her apartment the night before. The detective opened his mouth to talk and Karen realized she could hear his voice coming from a small speaker set into the wall above the viewing port. So... What happened then, Andy? I went looking for Chucky, and the whole house blew up. Do you have any idea why it blew up? Andy shook his head, so the detective continued. What were you doing there anyway, Andy? Why weren't you at school? Chucky wanted me to see Eddie. Jack, the mustachioed man, glanced over to the window, unable to see them but aware they were there, and then back to Andy. Do you mean Eddie Caputo? Now, why did Chucky want you to see him? He said that Eddie was an angel and he could take me up to heaven to visit my daddy. Karen pulled back, pain exploding in her chest. Mike was at her side in an instant. What? Andy lost his father recently. I, I know. He said. I read the police report on the accident. The car went off the road and Andy was thrown clear. I think something like that could give anybody emotional problems, especially a small child. Did your report also tell you that Andy saw it happen? That he was walking behind Bob, holding his hand when it happened? One second his father was there and the next Andy's hand was empty and people were screaming. No. 
Mike said quietly. It didn't. Andy ran out into the street to help his father. Bob was dead already, but Andy didn't realize that. He kept shaking Bob, begging him to get up. He was covered in Bob's blood when the police got there. They had to drag Andy off his father. Of course something like that will hurt a child, but Andy is doing better every day. He doesn't hurt people. He's just a little sad. I'm sorry, Mrs. Barkley. Karen turned back to the window. So am I. His father was a wonderful man. Jack was still questioning Andy. What about Aunt Maggie, Andy? Do you have any idea why she fell out that window? Jack leaned closer to Andy, a bloodhound smelling its prey. Andy looked over to a small table where his doll sat watching them. She saw Chucky, and it scared her so much she fell out. Karen stiffened and Mike turned to her. What? It's that damn doll, she answered. Ever since I bought Andy the thing, he's been insisting it was alive. Mike nodded. Yeah, I know. That's all he keeps talking about. Let me talk to him. Maybe I can find out what's going on. Mike hesitated, glancing over to a gray-haired man who wore large bifocal glasses and an odd necktie covered with cavorting ducklings. Mike had asked the man once why he wore such outrageous ties, and he'd answered that the kids loved them. What do you say, Doc? The older man's brow wrinkled in thought. Finally, he nodded. I think that would be a great idea. Karen frowned over at the man. I'm sorry, who are you? The man smiled to her and shook her hand. I apologize. Where are my manners? I'm Dr. Rufus Ardmore. I'm a state-appointed child psychologist assigned to review Andy's case here. He motioned towards the door. Please don't let me hold you up. We can talk later. Your son is waiting. Thank you. Karen said as she and Mike stepped out into the hallway and walked through another door into the little room. Andy saw her when she walked in and he leapt into her arms. They hugged each other tight and then Karen set him down on the couch and took the place beside him that had been vacated by Jack when they came in. Are, are you okay? She asked. Sure, I'm alright, Mommy. Andy, you've got to listen to me. Nobody believes you about Chucky. Unless you start telling the truth right now, they're going to take you away from me. Andy looked around at the two detectives and then rushed across the room to grab Chucky. He held him up, staring him in the freckled face. Do you hear that, Chucky? They're going to take me away unless you say something. Please say something! The good guy stared implacably back, refusing to make a sound. Andy raised his small fist and began to pound Chucky's body over and over again, screaming. Come on! Say something! Tell me why you lied to me about everything! Tell me why you lied about my daddy! Come on, Chucky! Tell me! Servos whined inside the doll and it turned its head. Hi, I'm Chucky, and I'm your friend to the end. Heidi ho Ha ha ha! Andy slammed his fist into Chucky one more time and then ran to his mother with tears in his eyes. Mommy, he's doing it on purpose. He told me never to tell about him or he'd kill me. A soft buzz filled the room, interrupting them, and then Dr. Ardmore's voice came through. Mrs. Uh, Barclay, I've heard more than enough. I think Andy should spend a couple of days with us at County General. The whole world shattered around Karen, and she slumped to her knees beside the couch. She looked up at the mirror to where the psychologist had been standing before. Please don't take him. I'm begging you. I'm sorry. I know this is difficult for the both of you, but my hands are tied. I must insist on an evaluation. He'll spend three days with us, and then hopefully I'll be able to send him back to you with a clean bill of health. What happens if you decide you can't? Silence spun out for a long moment, and then he said, Well, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Karen felt hope die. She looked around at Jack and Mike, wishing they could be the heroes she needed at that moment, wishing Mike Norris could swoop in and be her very own knight in shining armor. 
Mike grimaced and looked away. Karen looked back to her son and began to cry. Chapter 10 Revelation Karen Barkley had never felt more lost and hopeless in her life. The elevator door slid open and she trudged along the hall to the home she shared with her son. The home that was silent, cold, and empty now that Andy had been whisked away where she could not reach him. She reached the apartment door and shifted Andy's doll from one hand to the other so she could dig through her purse for her keys. The doll, Chucky, the one thing Andy wanted above all else, the thing that was supposed to make him happy, the thing that had seemingly destroyed their lives in a matter of hours. She glanced behind her at the balcony, railing beyond which lay a four-story plummet to the lobby below. She looked at the doll, considered tossing it over the edge, and decided against it. She found her keys, fumbled them, and watched them fall to the tiled floor at her feet. Damn it, she moaned, leaning her forehead against the wooden door frame. She didn't have the energy to perform the simple task of bending down and retrieving them. But what other choice did she have? She bent slowly, picked them up, and managed to open the apartment door without dropping them or the doll. She was met by the smell of fresh sawdust as she shuffled inside and shut the door behind her. It was warmer inside than she'd expected. She walked down the hall and peered around the corner into the kitchen, where she discovered a large panel of plywood tacked up over the broken window. Her landlord had been busy while she was out. She dropped her purse on the little table in the hallway and then carried Chucky into the living room, setting him on the coffee table. She collapsed back on the couch and stared at the smiling, freckled face with its chubby, dimpled cheeks and red hair. The doll stared back. She leaned forward, elbows on her knees, waiting. Silence spun out around them. Finally, the quiet was too much for her to bear any longer. She reached out and tapped Chucky hard on his sneakered foot. Well, say something, you little bastard. Nothing from the doll. Karen struck his foot again, knocking it to the edge of the table. Noticing the fine powdery remnants of spilled sugar that still clung to the soles of his shoes. Say something, damn it! Chucky blinked his sky-blue eyes and turned his head as if he were studying her as she studied him. Hi, I like to be hugged. Karen stared for a second and then burst into laughter. She stood, shaking her head as she made her way into the kitchen, where she drew herself a glass of water from the tap. Jesus Christ, what am I doing? I can't be buying into this lunacy. She drained the glass in three large swallows and set it aside for later use. She turned in a circle, listless, unsure of what to do. Normally, she would be washing the dishes from dinner and making sure Andy was brushing his teeth and taking his bath. After that, she would settle in beside him in the bed and read him a story. Tonight, there would be no story because there was no Andy, and this fact left her adrift in a sea of anxiety. She glanced around and her eyes fell on the bright yellow and red box resting in the corner beside the trash can, a cartoonish drawing of Chucky waving from the side panel. She walked over and picked up the box. A good guy doll is a kid's best friend, she read, snorting derisively. Yeah, sure. She tipped the box over, meaning to jam it into the trash bin, and froze when something fell out of the open box onto the linoleum floor. Karen stared down at the things in wide-eyed horror, her hands numb. Two big batteries wrapped in plastic lay at her feet. Karen twisted the box in her hand, searching through the product descriptions and copyright legalize, finding what she was looking for near the bottom. Batteries included. It read in bright red letters. But that's impossible. I've seen it move. I've heard the damn thing talk. She dropped the box by the trash can and slowly inched around the corner into the living room expecting the doll to have moved or vanished entirely, but it was exactly where she'd left it. 
She took a breath, her muscles rigid, and found that she had to force her feet to move. She did not want to go near the thing, did not want to be alone with it. Suck it up, buttercup, she thought. Something weird is going on here and Andy needs you. She crossed the room and picked up Chucky with shaking hands. He felt perfectly normal in her hands, his rigid plastic arms and head cool to the touch. She flipped him over and undid the Velcro holding the back of his clothes together, revealing a little hatch in the small of his back, with the words, Batteries Go Here, written on it in raised lettering. She fingered the catch and opened the hatch to reveal what she dreaded to find, an empty battery compartment. Suddenly, Chucky's head revolved around completely backwards on his neck in an uncanny imitation of little Reagan O'Neill and the Exorcist. Clear blue eyes stared up at her, not vacant now, but seemingly full of malevolent menace. Hi, I'm Chucky. Wanna play? Karen shrieked and let the demonic doll fall to the carpet. It hit the floor and rolled out of sight beneath the couch. Karen took a quick step back, her heart jackhammering in her chest. It talked without batteries, it really did. The world seemed to be spinning apart around her, revealing hints of unexpected dark gulfs beyond. Madness lay down that path. Karen didn't have time for that, so she forced the darkness away and forced herself to focus on Andy. What if Andy was telling the truth? She stepped towards the couch and knelt down, ready to spring back if something tried to grab at her from the dark space beneath. She lifted the fringe, looked under. Chucky lay motionless on his back. To Karen, he looked like a poisonous snake poised to strike. She reached out and dragged him to her by his limp foot. She picked him up and stood, holding him up. He stared back at her with blank, glassy eyes. Karen narrowed her eyes, staring back. She wasn't falling for this act anymore. Talk, she demanded. Come on, talk to me. Chucky remained silent. She shook Chucky as hard as she could, his red hair flopping back and forth. I said talk, damn it. I know what you're doing. You're doing the same thing to me that you did to Andy, aren't you? Well, it's not going to work anymore, you little shit. Say something if you're alive. Nothing. Karen growled deep in her throat. She looked over to the mantel to the fake spindle of yarn with its collection of matches within and came to a decision. She looked back to the passive doll. I've got something for you. Oh, yes. I'm going to make you talk. She charged across the room to the fireplace and twisted the knob to turn on the gas, then fumbled a match from the jar, struck it against the mantel and tossed it into the fireplace. The gas ignited with a whoosh, filling the grate with bright orange flames. Last chance, she shouted, holding Chucky over her head. Talk to me or I'm going to throw you in the fire. Life returned to the evil doll's face, changing its vapid, wholesome face into that of a deranged maniac. You stupid bitch, he shouted, flailing his arms and legs, trying to break free of her grasp. You think you can fuck with me? Nobody fucks with me. Karen gripped him harder, trying to hold on, but it was like holding on to a bag full of writhing worms. Chucky lunged forward, his mouth open wide to reveal a set of gleaming teeth and clamped down on the tender flesh of her forearm. She screamed as her skin tore and blood began to flow into the crook of her outstretched arm. She opened her hands and let Chucky fall to the floor. He landed on his feet, lithe as a cat, and charged forward to wrap Karen's legs in a surprisingly strong grip. She fell on her face, felt a new pain bloom in her calf as Chucky bit her again. She kicked him away and sat up. Hidey ho, bitch! <laughs> Chucky cackled dancing and fainting like a boxer just out of her reach. Don't you know who I am? I'm the bringer of pain. Don't fuck with me or you die. You can't stop me. No one can. Chucky charged towards Karen, intent on inflicting agony upon agony, but she was ready this time. 
she reached with her left hand, took a fireplace poker from a rack, and whipped it across side-armed in front of her. The poker struck Chucky in the chest and sent him flying through the air. He hit the wall with a soft thwap and bounced up immediately, beginning his boxer hop again. Didn't you know? I'm indestructible. Do you hear me? Indestructible, bitch. <laughs> Karen brandished the poker at him, waving him closer, fire in her eyes. Indestructible, huh? Come over here and let's test that theory. I'll show you who the real bitch is, little man. Chucky looked from the improvised weapon to his new warrior woman and laughed again. He took a step towards the archway to the hall. Hey, do you know who isn't indestructible? Your bratty little kid. He's gonna fry for what I've done. Isn't a damn thing you can do about it. Do you hear me? He's going to fry. No, he won't. Not after I show them you. Oh, yes. <laughs> He cackled. He gave her the finger and then spun and sprinted into the hall. Karen heard the apartment door being opened and realized the little bastard was leaving. No, she thought, scrambling to her feet and limping as fast as she could after him. I have to stop him or Andy's going to be gone forever. She heard the ding of the elevator as she exited the apartment, heard Chucky's laughter as the elevator door slid closed. <laughs> no, wait! The elevator car started down too fast. Karen hobbled to the top of the stairs and gave chase down. One flight of stairs, two. She was closing in, could see Chucky's orange mop of hair through the elevator shaft's cage. She reached the next landing and then her injured leg turned traitor, spilling her to the hard tile floor. She scrambled to her feet, charged to the lobby one flight down to find the elevator door open and the car empty. No! No! She ran outside and spun around, searching the sidewalks and street for any flash of red or blue and saw nothing. Chucky was gone. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been chapters 9 and 10 of Child's Play by Jeremy Terry. Really enjoyed these chapters. Love this part of the movie, one of my favorite parts. Not just the, the whole thing at the police station, you know, where they're really... Because, I mean, if you'd never seen the movie, I guess a part of you might think that, that Andy is losing it. He's just taking stuff he's hearing on the news, you know, and making it fit with his little delusion. But just knowing that Chucky's sitting there listening to everything that's going on and getting a kick out of it, and he killed Eddie Caputo, it's just, it's it's funny in a morbid way. But I really love uh, when Mom gets home with Chucky, batteries fall out of the box, you know, and she threatens Chucky to the point, you know, where he can't uh, ignore it anymore. He's got to reveal his secret or he's going to burn. Even though he says he's indestructible, right? Um, you know, I guess on Looney Tunes, that guy could have done that to the frog, you know, to prove to people that he could sing. Hello, my baby. Hello, my darling. A lot of, like, younger people aren't going to get that reference, probably. Um, but, yeah. So, it's kind of the same scenario there. Could have got the frog to talk, just like Mom got the good guy to talk. Um, I love that when he came to, he is just pissed off because this bitch has fucked up his plans, uh, you know, just biting her. I mean, come on, <laughs> biting her twice. <clears throat> Go, Charles. Um, yeah, so I've got nothing but good things to say about these chapters. I love the way uh, that Jeremy's writing this book. I'm enjoying the story, even though I've seen the movie a thousand times. So I hope you're all enjoying it as well. Losing my voice over here doing the Chucky cackle too many times. Um, I hope my Chucky voice is okay. 
I know I'm no Brad Dourif, but I was having fun with Angry Chucky. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. I'd love to hear what you guys thought of these two chapters. Uh, thanks again to Mike, uh, the voice of Mike, which is Sean Campbell. You might know him from Out of Print Slashers podcast and uh, the Patreon exclusive After the Slash podcast. And we got Garbage Bell Queen returning as Andy. So both of you guys and gal, you're doing an amazing job. Thank you so much for coming in and doing this. And Garbage, thank you for voicing Chucky in Child's Play 2 and this book. Um, I'm going to be back soon with more. If I'm not back before Christmas, I hope everybody that celebrates Christmas has a very Merry Christmas. I hope everybody had a Happy Hanukkah. Just anything you celebrate, I hope it was great. Happy Holidays to everybody. I will be back soon before the new year, I promise you that, with more Child's Play by Jeremy Terry. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian and Chucky saying thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other. Have a good night, and I'll see you soon. And always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. <laughs> good night, everybody.